So Brandt Smart BMO um, is a new product for Brandt Consolidated. We just came out with it here, uh, kind of launched it this year. And a lot of you are really familiar with, with foliar boron, particularly on soybeans and cotton here down in the, the southeast. Um, and Brandt's has done a lot of research about boron and, and how to utilize boron. But in particular for Brandt Smart BMO, we're looking for how do we get boron to go through the cuticle of the wheat, the cuticle of the leaf, and be able to translocate to where it needs, which is a big challenge uh, for boron. And that's one of the advantages to this product, and I'll touch it real briefly. Next slide. So if, if you look at boron, how it's associated in tissue, it's a cross-linking agent. And you see that diagram to the left where you see that cross-link that provides stability structure. Boron is typically associated, I would say, over 80% of it into cell wall structures, and it provides structural integrity, uh, which is very unique. If you were to liken that to a steel bridge where you see steel bridge with cross-linking, that cross-linking provides structural integrity. It's really important in expanding cell tissues and growing points in the plant, meristemic tissues, and also extremely important during the reproductive cycle of that. The picture to the left, or the ones with the sugars, I guess it would be your left, you gotta get that right. You see that boron crosslink looks very similar to the thing on the right. One of the things that, that we've identified in our research is that when you apply foliar boron, it actually gets through the cuticle fairly well, at least compared to other micronutrients. But once it gets in and through the cuticle down into the apoplastin cells, it tends to bind to pectins. Pectins are polymeric sugars and that's what it's showing there. The issue with that from a foliar boron point of view or foliar boron application is once it cross-links, boron is considered a non-mobile element. So even though in a lot of our earlier chemistries when we were getting boron through, we weren't getting it to mobilize as well as we would like. Next slide. So what we did from a research point of view, and when you look at how boron is bound, it's bound to hydroxyl groups and typically sugars or pectins. And in our original uh, chemistries, we bound it to mannitol. Now, boron moves up and down the phloem of a plant through um, the phloem, often bound to sugars, like shown here to the left. And in fact, our earlier chemistry in front of Brandt Smart System was Manaflex chemistry, shown right here to the left. So we found that we got better mobility with the Manaflex chemistry or sugar alcohols, but we weren't getting it to move quite as well as we liked. So the driver to that and trying to figure out why that didn't work as well as it should was important to us. And what we figured out that that particular complex that you see up there with the sugar bound, that stability of that complex is pH stable. So when the pH dropped down below seven, those sugars fell off the boron or released the boron and it would bind to the pectin, which we thought was really interesting because pectin, pretty much the same binding process as here. So we were, why did that happen? Well, it turns out it binds to pectin pretty well at a more neutral to lower pH. So the obvious thing for us to try to do was make a boron product a lot like our Manaflex chemistry that was bound on either side that would be protected so that when it went through the cuticle leaf, it would actually move and get better mobility. So in smart boron, this is what we've done. It's cross-linked on two sides. Instead of the sugar alcohols, this complex is stable over a wider pH range. So when that boron goes through the cuticle of the leaf and gets into the apoplast and the cell walls, it doesn't bind immediately. It allows it to get into the phloem and have better mobility. And that's the whole concept behind the Brandt Smart Boron system. Um, and, and that's what Randy had out here on his field this year that he'll talk about. So that was what new in terms of that product. The other one we have, and, and Randy, I think it's probably Randy's favorite one of the one we have, is, brand, or is the InBoost 5. Now, InBoost 5 helps the plant utilize nitrogen. It's not a nitrogen efficiency thing in terms of being like NBPT or nitropyrin. What it does is it acts on the cells within the plant and makes them utilize the ammonical nitrogen more efficiently and turn it into proteins. Next slide here. So it, it's interesting that sucrose is naturally existing. You have a lot of carbon in the plant. Um, and sugar plays a major role in nutrient translocation and storage, supplying the plant with additional sources of glucose. And the end boost goes in and, and it acts on the chloroplast and the mitochondria in a process in which the ammonical nitrogen will bind into the sugars and get turned to proteins. For the next slide. So this is kind of how the process works here. In order for InBoost 
to really work, you have to have a sufficient enough nitrogen for it to work. So you can't go out and say, I'm not going to apply nitrogen and apply inboost and get, get a response. What it does is it takes the existing nitrogen, particularly if that nitrogen is coming from an ammonium sulfate or a urea source. Um, it takes that, it drives that from the photosynthase from the sugar, pulls them together into the amino acids and the protein and the growth point of view. So often when you say something about nitrogen utilization, you're thinking about stabilizing nitrogen, uh, urease inhibitors, um, things along that line. This is a lot different in that we're acting on the plant cells itself to take the existing ammonical nitrogen within the plant itself and associate it into proteins um, and amino acids. Next. 